What I'm going to do uh, in the next 20 minutes or so is to guide you through the environmental risk assessment that we did for one of the priority compounds. And I'm going to reflect a bit on that. But you already see uh, one of the critical issues that we're facing. Uh, we just heard how many dozens or hundreds of potential or actually hazardous chemicals we're dealing with. And we were looking at just one of them, which uh, definitely is a problem. Uh, but we are rather sure that this is a compound worth looking into. So let me guide you through that. We were actually not really sure who would be in the audience, so forgive me if I'm preaching a bit to the choir for just a second. Um, so what we have been doing is an environmental risk assessment, and that basically means we have been looking at the exposure and the toxicity, or in our case, the ecotoxicity of that particular chemical. And then we try to see how do those two uh, values relate to each other. So that was the idea. We have been using BBP for the simple reason that it's an important chemical that is used in a lot of different products and a lot of different materials that we are exposed to. So that's uh, the uh, main reason for doing that. And when we're using that, that also implies that the chemicals are actually entering the environment. They are basically leaching from the materials embedded in our buildings, in our consumer goods. Uh, they are leaching from uh, waste sites and things like that. So that is where the exposure of the environment actually comes from. Just for those of you who are a bit more into the toxicology, ecotoxicology um, or risk assessment area, the compound is actually quite lipophilic, has a quite low water solubility. It's actually pretty quickly degraded in the environment, dependent especially on the microbial activity in the environment. Um, so I'm going to come back to that perhaps later. It has a low bioaccumulation. It actually has no discernible biomagnification. So it's not a compound comparable to DDT, for example which is a really good thing. We're not the first ones who are looking at the compound. Environment and Climate Change Canada has been evaluating uh, the phthalates and all of them in a much bigger project. I was one of the external reviewers for that project, so let me just allow you to, uh, let me just allow to basically quote that BBP amongst other phthalates are highly hazardous to fish, invertebrates, algae, etc., etc. And uh, secondary effects linked to estrogenic, thyroid, and antiandrogenic modes of action. We're going to hear more about that when we're looking at the possible human health implications of the phthalates. But that's basically another argument to say that let's take a closer look at that chemical, uh, at that uh, particular chemical. This is just looking at things from the hazard side of things. Uh, we also have been uh, data from the European Chemicals Agency. The compound is classified as a substance of very high concern under REACH. I'm not going more into detail just right now what that implies and what does that mean, but uh, sufficient to say that the compound is on the authorization list, so basically you're not simply allowed to use the chemical, but you have to get a special authorization uh, in order to be able to embed that chemical in certain products. And that implies that the use of uh, that compound in Europe is very, very, very limited, at least the official use. So if you're looking at the dossiers, we have one registrant in Europe uh, with an announced production volume between 0 and 10 tons per year. So you might be asking, well, the compound is not really relevant for Europe, so why the hell have you been working with that compound? And there are three reasons. Uh, actually, I only listed two of them, but there's a third one. The third one is, of course, uh, we're not only looking at the situation in Europe, but we are looking at a global issue. But the other thing is, of course, we have articles, plastic articles coming into Europe for which we only have a very limited understanding what's actually in there. And the other, perhaps even really important issue is that we have been using the compound substantially. And that means the compound is embedded in our societal infrastructure and the products that we are continuing to using in our waste sites, uh, if we are not burning your waste. Uh, so we have long-term emission sources of that chemical into the environment. So that's the reason for concern. Uh, 
So the aim of what we have been doing in the environmental uh, assessment here is we have been collecting the existing data. And we have been going through um, the uh, different databases, the US EPA's Ecotox database being the most important one. There were others, uh, I'm not going to mention them here. We have been doing a plausibility check of the retrieved data in order to see does that actually uh, confirm or is that actually compliant with the data as they have been published in the peer-reviewed literature. We have been searching directly into the primary literature and then we had a long list of different endpoints, of different findings that we try to merge into something where we, that we could make sense of. So we first remove all the duplicates, etc. Then we classify everything into acute and chronic toxicity. We recalculated the acute toxicity to the chronic toxicity, which is a leap of faith. I'm very much aware of that, but uh, that's basically what you have to do in order to just get an overview. And then we started to simply average that. And from an environmental perspective, our critical protection aim or, or the, the, the item that we're working with is a species. We want to protect biodiversity, we want to protect individual species. So we have been averaging that to get one ecotoxicity estimate for every species for which we could find toxicity data. We have been doing a similar exercise for uh, the exposure side of things. We have been collecting the uh, publicly available monitoring data across the world as long as they were readily available, especially as long as they were available in language that we could understand. We have been deleting all the non-detects. We have to keep that in mind when we're discussing things. So there are a lot of monitoring uh, efforts where the compound was not found. Uh, so that's something to be, uh, yeah, we have to have that in the back of our heads. And we have been focusing uh, only on fresh water. The rationale for that is that fresh water is where the high exposures are taking place. Marine waters uh, is definitely something uh, that is, uh, yeah, where the dilution is so big that the concentrations there are simply lower. That's why we went for the fresh water. Okay, let's just, um, um, apologies for that, some uh, uh, more uh, down-to-earth scientific uh, figures here, but I try to guide you through them. This is what is called a species sensitivity distribution. And what we have been doing here is we have been looking at the final data in relation to each other. So here is a plot where these are the concentrations that are causing harm to all those individual species. So we see that for some species they are very sensitive, so at low concentrations the compound is already causing ecotoxicological impacts. And then we have other species that are more and more tolerant towards that particular chemical. So this gives us an overview of how biodiversity is actually reacting to the presence of that compound. When you try to do, when we try to use those assessments within a regulatory context, uh, this is too complex. We want to have one value to characterize how toxic the chemical is. And what people are usually using is the so-called HCO5. And that's the concentration that is hazardous for 5% of the exposed species. So from a regulatory perspective, we are basically saying putting 5% of the species at risk is tolerable. So you basically just look at 5% of the species and then you see that you are down in the lower part of that distribution here. That HCO5, as we have been using that, as I'm going to present that to you, does not include an assessment factor, a safety factor. That's a factor that you often use or usually use in order to cover gaps in your understanding. There are hundreds, millions of species that we haven't tested. There are life cycle stages that we haven't been tested. There are physiological processes that we haven't looked at. And all of that uh, is captured or is supposed to be captured in that assessment factor, which gives you a buffer between the data that you have and reality. So I'm just going to use that value uh, in its raw form. So the HCO5 is 187 nanomoles per liter. So that's the concentration where we would see in 5% of the species actual toxic effects. If you're just ignoring all experimental data and you just do in silico toxicity estimation, you end up with 300 nanomoles per liter, so that's uh, higher. What ECHA has been doing, or the companies uh, that was around 2005, 2007, uh, they analyzed uh, data that were available at that time and they ended up with a regulatory acceptable concentration of 10.4 nanomoles per liter. 
And what you can see is that there is a difference between our value and that value. And actually, it's roughly, it's, it's slightly more than a factor of 10. And factor of 10 is actually the standard safety factor that you would be using there. So our results and the regulatory results are very much in line with each other. Uh, they just look different here because this includes that safety factor, that buffer, while this one here does not. That's where the difference comes from. This is the most sensitive species uh, that uh, is uh, recorded in the literature. It's uh, Hieronymus, um, and we have a chronic no-observed effect concentration of 3.2 nanomoles per liter. So this is um, the most sensitive endpoint and creature that we are uh, having in our data. So that's what we have from the ecotox side of things. And Let's just look at how that compares to the actual environmental occurrences. So we have been collecting uh, the data uh, from monitoring studies, and I'm just showing you Europe, uh, northern part of uh, America, and uh, the rest of the world. Uh, not because the rest of the world is less important, just because there are fewer data available. So here is the distribution of all the data. Remember, all the non-detects are not included here. But these are all the data where um, uh, people have been finding that compound. And here we have our three. I, I deleted the in silico toxicity because we actually have experimental data. But here we have our three toxicity estimates. So we have our most sensitive species, which is here. We have our predicted no effect concentration, which is the regulatory acceptable concentration here. And we have here we have the results from the species sensitivity distribution without uh, taking any assessment factor into consideration. And what we can see that there is a considerable overlap, depending on which value you want to use, and there is no straight answer to that. But we see that in every situation, we have situations where the exposure in the freshwater aquatic environment uh, actually puts organisms at risk. If we are just going for um, the HC5, we see that we only have a mere two values here. If we're looking at the predicted no effect concentrations, we are having far more here. And when we're looking at the most sensitive species, it's basically half uh, the data that indicate risk. It looks very much like uh, in the US, and for some reason I lost uh, my most sensitive species here, so sorry for that. Uh, but that is, of course, somewhere uh, on the left side here. But again, we see the overlap between the exposure data and uh, the, the hazard data that we have. And then finally, the few data from the rest of the world. Uh, the problem there is it's not only that we simply have fewer data, it's also that the accessing those data, finding those data and getting them in a language, uh, my Chinese is not very good, I have to admit, uh, is really something uh, that, that is a limitation here. The interesting thing, if let me just go back to Europe, I'm most familiar with that one. The interesting thing here is what we are seeing here is, is something that we have to keep in mind whenever we're doing risk assessment. And that is the more thorough you are, the more effort you put into monitoring your environment, the more your country will be highlighted in those plots. The less you do, the less you know, the less you pop up in those assessments, which is a real problem. We, we intuitively think about all those countries that are not here don't have a problem. That's not the case. We have many more countries in Europe, and for most of them we simply don't know what's going on, which is something completely different from them being on the safe side of things. So it's not that in that case here Croatia is perhaps very, very polluted, it's just that they actually have been measuring. And we have to keep that in mind when we're putting things into perspective. Okay, um, that already brings me to uh, summaries and conclusions. Uh, so we actually find the compound routinely in monitoring surveys in the freshwater environment. We in, in roughly 30% uh, of the cases where people have been looking for the compounds, they are finding that. Which is good in one way, because in two-thirds the compound is not there. We still have 30% uh, where we have reason uh, for concern. We have huge differences in the amounts found. If you look at the, if you have looked at the concentration scale, it's orders of magnitude different between the different uh, monitoring campaigns. But we also have huge differences in the sensitivity of the different organisms, and that is a problem when you want to draw hard and fast and global conclusions. You can't say it's safe 
and you can't say it's not safe. You have to basically look at the local conditions. You have to look at which species are there. So if you have the situation where you have an environment where Hieronymus, as the most sensitive species, just doesn't occur naturally, the assessment is something completely different than when that's a keystone species in that particular system. Uh, it depends on the concentrations that you're finding, etc. So we have to keep that in mind and we have to face the complexity of the exposure and the hazard situation that we're having there. Having said that, uh, that's where we are, and that's basically a straightforward environmental risk assessment of that particular compound. Those of you who have been uh, listening to some of my other talks, um, there is that elephant in the room that I usually like to talk about, and that is, of course, that that particular compound is not the only phthalate that we are concerned with. It's just one representative of a whole range of very, very similar phthalates. And already in 2008, uh, we have that report from the National Academy of Sciences that we're looking at things more from a human health perspective, basically saying that we really need to take their cumulative effects, their mixture effects, into considerations. This was something that was simply out of scope in this project uh, because it really takes days, weeks and years to collect and assess and quality check those data. So we haven't been doing that. Uh, but the other problem is also when we are looking at the actual monitoring data, People don't look at the combinations there. They just want to find BBP in our case or something like that. So very often they are only having a pre-selected two or three or four phthalates, but they are not looking at the whole chemical zoo that might be out there. So it's not only a real challenge in terms of assessing the data, it's also something that we have to become better in keeping in mind when we're actually doing environmental monitoring. So combination effects is definitely something that we want to keep uh, further an eye on. That's work in the future, work to be done still. That's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Thomas. Excellent presentation. Do we have any clarifying questions? Hold your comments for the discussion. Can you say your name, please? Michel Casar from Plastics Europe. I have a question in one of your findings. You, you indicate huge difference uh, and you saw that in different parts depending on the results, depending on... on. Did you try to make any link between the findings where you find some, from some higher concentrations with, with the environments? Did you find any reasons to justify why in those cases they were higher, uh, the, the presence was higher than in others? That's, that's a really good question. That's one of the uh, final work steps that we are at the moment. We want to take a closer look at two things. The one thing is, why do we have high concentrations in those areas? My, my uh, gut feeling or my, my, uh, yeah, my assumption is that these are sites that are near wastewater sites, for example, that are near uh, um, uh, garbage dumps and things like that, where you have a constant emission into the environment. But we need to check that. It could also be stormwater runoff or something like that. But it's something close to where you have collections of that material. So that is definitely one thing that we need to get a better understanding understanding of uh, in order to do the assessment. The second thing is what is a bit surprising for us is that the most sensitive species that we have been finding are Hieronymids. Uh, and they have a completely different hormonal system uh, than we humans have. Uh, and that basically means uh, it's not those creatures where we have an uh, anti, uh, androgenic uh, mode of action or something like that. It's, it's, it's creatures with a completely different life cycle. We're talking about insects, by the way. Uh, a completely different uh, lifestyle. And we just want to understand why are they so much more sensitive than a fish, for example, which has a hormonal system that is very much alike to a human. So um, the idea or the, the question there is what's the mode of action in those species here and what makes them so sensitive? Or is it just because it's a long-term exposure and that's why they are more sensitive? So we need to find out that. So that's the two follow-up things that we're doing right now uh, before we are hopefully publishing that in the open literature. <laughs>